This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Stevenson Ministries and the Houston Faith Church family. Now, let me, let me start off with a couple scriptures here. Uh, Ephesians 4 is the passage where it talks about Jesus. Before he ascended, he descended. Then he ascended and he led captivity captive. He took everybody out of the depths of the earth who were righteous, took them to heaven. And then he came, went to heaven he gave gifts to men. And they were in the form of people, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Uh, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, to the Son of God. And then it goes on and says uh, that we should all grow up speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things into Christ. Grow up in all things into Christ. So you and I have a mandate from our Lord to grow up. Amen. Look at your friends, say, grow up. And so that, that is part of a, a real disciple's life is you recognize I need to learn with the purpose of growing. If you only learn, you won't grow. If you only learn, you'll just get Your head will grow. So you don't want to just learn. You have to grow. And growing requires exercise. It requires development. It requires doing. So you must be a hearer and a doer if you're going to grow. Amen. And in growing as a child would in a family with a father, it does require lots of hand-holding, lots of instruction, lots of, lots of explanation, lots of trial and error, lots of rebuke, lots of correction, lots of question asking, lots of question answering. Uh, and so the word chastisement comes into child training, okay? And this is where we recognize we need it. Uh, one scripture in Proverbs 21 says, every way of man is right in his own eyes. Right. So you believe in Jesus. We applaud you. We welcome you to the kingdom. You're my brother and sister. But still, you think what you're doing is right. You think your way is right. Every man thinks his way is right. Eh, well, if you're going to grow, you're going to have to submit that way to the Lord. So you don't just get to run around doing your own will. you got to find out God's will. That's part of the Christian life. You understand that. It says, every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. Mm -hmm. So you may have lots of stuff going on where you think you know something, but he knows what your heart's really thinking. He knows the motives. He knows the reasons. He knows where you're missing it. He knows where you need to be corrected. He knows where you're doing well, where you're doing not so well. <clears throat> He's trying to help us because he knows our heart, right. trying to steer you away from pride, steer you away from self ambition, steer away from all those things that really aren't his will. He knows it. He knows your heart. So you can't trick God. Amen. How many of you have ever tried to trick God? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you've tried to ignore, you've tried to act like something. You can't do that. You know, you can't do that. You do it, but you can't do it. You know, you, know you shouldn't, but you do sometimes. You try to act like it's not there. You just kind of close your eyes and act like there's no issue, but there is an issue and you know it and the Lord knows it. And so he needs us to go ahead and empty self, go ahead and let that part go too. go ahead and let that opinion go too. And so uh, that's part of this. Uh, I'm going to give you the definition a little bit in, in a moment uh, because Proverbs 12, 15 also says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he who heeds counsel is wise. So let's recognize that this Christian life requires us heeding instruction, correction, rebuke, and counsel. And, you know, it's really about 50-50 on the Christians and the disciples uh, that, that, that are looking for some direction in life. Very few, I mean, let's say 50% will heed instruction from God's word, from the Holy Spirit, and from pastors and teachers and leaders. True. Only about 50%, the rest decided. The rest have already decided what they feel, what they're going to do. And uh, you just can't do that, okay? So if you're going to try to live without the Holy Spirit and your spirit and God 
and the Bible, the Word of God, and, and those in the Lord that are over you somewhat in the Lord, if you're, if you're just going to try to ignore those things and do your own thing, uh, uh, with the declaration, I know God wants this for me. I know this is from God. I know this is, well, really? I mean, it takes a real honest, sincere, mature person to submit something that you really want to the Lord. Usually what we really want, that's it. That's God's way. He put it in my heart. It's been there forever. I know it's from God. <laughs> well, if that's the case, there'd be a lot of single people in here getting married because they just knew that that was for them. Come on, preach it. The eyes, the eye, you can't trust your eyeballs. <clears throat> uh, so open your Bible here to... Uh, Hebrews 12, we'll, we'll go to the chapter in just a moment, the, the, the big chapter that you've skipped all these years. We'll get there. Proverbs 3.12, you can put that up if you want. Proverbs 3.12 says, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects. That's right. Just as a father would a son in whom he delights. So if the father loves you, he's going to correct you. Now, no child really likes to be corrected, do they? They throw a fit, they, they, have, they sulk, they do all that. No child really wants to be corrected, do they? But Christians, do you want to be corrected? Yes. Just say it by faith. Say it, I say, I want to be corrected by God. <laughs> say, Lord, I give you permission to correct me. It will make me happier. It really will make you happier. You just have to believe that by faith. Uh, so the, the word chasten inherently means, or chastening or, or chastisement, it means child training. Most of the time that it's used in the Bible, it's talking about instruction, not correction. But it does include correction and discipline. Like in the Old Testament, the word's used in some form about 30, 30 times it's referring simply to instruction. Uh, all those scriptures where with wisdom and instruction, uh, those who desire wisdom and instruction will live long, stuff like that. It's instruction. And that's really what he's trying to do. He's just trying to train us. If you would listen the first time, there'd be no correcting. So think of chastisement or chastening as child training. He's trying to grow us up. And so if you can get the lesson right the first time, man, you're not going to have to go around the mountain. Have you ever felt like you were going around the mountain? That was chastisement. Now, one reason we have to identify what chastisement is and is not is because many people have thrown every difficulty of their life into the bucket of chastisement. Every time something goes wrong in their life, God must be chastening me. I must have done something wrong. No, that's not. That's the, the false interpretation that's misled so many Christians and caused them to distrust God and miss his promises. If they're thinking, well, I, I was hoping to have a blessing and victory, but I didn't, so I guess God's trying to uh, correct me. I guess I'm doing something wrong. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. God, uh, his, his promises are secure for you. Amen. Uh, and then we have to find out where chastisement fits in this life. Okay. So the main definition is child training. It means to be instructed or taught or learn. It means to correct. It means to mold the character of others by reproof and admonition. You'll be told that you're wrong. Now, the way God tells you that you're wrong first is with a knowing. He's not going to wave a finger in your physical eyes. Uh, he's not going to slap you on the face or the buttocks. He's, he's not going to say a loud sentence to you. Most of uh, the way he's trying to correct you and lead you away from wrong things is with a knowing in your heart, with an unction, with a sense, with a witness of the spirit inside your spirit. It's your spirit that's going to know this first. So if you're clueless about spiritual things, you'll have no clue how God's correcting you. And that's why we're trying to be spiritual people so that we can take this on. Uh, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12 So, so think of it this way. As we move into this chapter, think of it as father training his child, father correcting his child, father disciplining his child. Uh, 
And if you think about that just in a general sense, parents never harm their children to, cur- to train them. Child training does not include harm. You understand that? Now, hurt my feelings doesn't count. I mean, a kid gets corrected, I hurt my feelings. Eh, that's not what that is, son. <laughs> uh, there is no physical harm in child training. That's not how parents train their children. Now, we believe the Bible, so spanking with a rod is important to drive the foolishness out of children, but never to harm them. If ever you harm them, you have missed it. You've messed up if you ever harm a child. The only reason a rod is needed is to shock them. The shock re- causes them to recognize, ooh, I have, I have done something. There's no lasting mark. There's no harm. There's no injury. Absolutely never. Never do you do it out of anger. Never do you do it out of uh, resentment. Never do you, because your feelings are hurt or because you were scared. Never do you harm a child in any kind of chastisement. Never. You don't train them with harm. Amen. So all chastisement would be is to shock you and to help you recognize, whoa. Now, parents spank their children on the outside. God doesn't. He spanks you on the inside. This is spirit to spirit relationship with God. So the way that God chastises us is on the inside. All right. We're talking about that. What does that mean? How does that feel? We'll read some scripture so that you can see it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Start with verse 5. And and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to us as to sons or children. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord love, he loves, he chastens. So, so notice these terms. Don't despise the chastening. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked. Like a child gets discouraged when they're corrected sometimes, right? They shouldn't. They need this. And so they'll, they'll figure it out later. Tomorrow they'll be okay. But they start to get discouraged. Christians do it too. It says, don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by the Lord, by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And that word scourges, you got to look that up. That, that's scary. Like, what's a scourge? Well, um, don't be scared of that word. He's not talking about physical scourging. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you're without chastening, of, of which all have become partakers, then you're all illegitimate and not sons. So if you're not going to allow God to correct you, you're an illegitimate son. And this is where you find a lot of believers in Christ. They're really wow. not in the house. They believe in Jesus. They're, they're far from God, far from the kingdom, far from the house. There's no correcting them. Anytime you try to quote a scripture to somebody out there, even if they believe in Jesus and they just turn their nose up at you, I'm not claiming everyone, but that's high illegitimacy. Illegitimate, not sons, if you're not going to let the Lord correct you. So if you get offended when a scripture is quoted at you, watch it. Amen. Verse 9, uh, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed to be best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Glory to God. Glory partakers to God. of his holiness. Glory to God. <clears throat> now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. That word painful shows up, and, and that's where people, oh, see, see, I had some pain, must be chasing. No, no. <clears throat> that's the, that word painful, we're going to read another scripture in a moment. That word painful is the same word for sorrow used in other places. So it's not talking about physical pain. It's talking about sorrow. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands that hang down the feeble knees, make straight paths. We'll, we'll, 
for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather let it be healed. Pursue peace with all peace, uh, people in holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone should fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up and cause trouble and many become defiled. Okay, so go back, go back here and let's talk a little bit about it. So uh, have you ever read the Bible? Turn, turn to 2 Timothy, and as we'll do, I'll give you some analogy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. There's two main ways that the Lord chastens us. Uh, and none of them are with a, a car crash, a hot stove, or scalding water, okay? Two ways. He chastens us with his word and with his spirit. Just like a parent would. It's, it's, it's with words. That's how, you, that's how you rebuke. With words, instruction, admonition, correction, sternness, reminder. <clears throat> uh, so have you ever read the Bible where it says, like, love one another? And then you read 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love is not rude nor self-seeking. You're sitting in church and, and the definition comes out, love is not rude or self-seeking. Because you thought you were you're loving one another, you're obeying the main command, love. And then love is not rude and irritable at home. And you go, ooh. You've just been chastened. He just chastised you right there. That was the Holy Spirit alerted to you, that's you, buddy. <laughs> and he did it with words. He did it with a scripture. He did it with an unction. He did it with an acknowledgement of what was true. Right, right. He didn't have to harm you, punch you in the nose. He punched you in the spirit. He didn't, God didn't, God instantly on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, he, he, he corrected you. He helped you recognize, you know what? I need to apologize. Amen. Boom. He did it and he did it without a car crash. Hallelujah. He did it without killing your family or stealing your job or, or, or putting pneumonia on you. So that's the, the, that's the, the most precious and necessary form of chastening right here is the word of God. You read it or you hear it preached and boom, it nails you. You've just been chastened. Now, learning is one thing. Being reprimanded from the word, that's chastening. It happens all the time to us. That's why you need to let the word, uh, you need to fall on the word. You need to let the word in. Let it, let it fix you. Jesus said, if you do not fall on this word and be broken, it will fall on you and crush you. Praise the Lord. Have you ever felt like in here uh, during the preaching that the message was just for you? You were just chastened. In some respects, that's a lot of times what happens. Oh, man, that was, that was really, you know, pulling the reins on me. Just think of it that way. It's God pulling the reins on us. Those who don't allow a horse's bit in their mouth from God, they're illegitimate. You got to let God... Direct you, train you, correct you. Amen. You ever felt, anytime you've ever felt convicted or, or shamed for your sin or ashamed in some way like that, uh, and it brought you to repentance, that was the chastening of the Lord. Right. Simple as that. <clears throat> now, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16 says... Well, let's read um, verse 14. You, you're talking to, Paul talking to Timothy. You must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the word of God is here for correction. And when the Lord does it, you've been chastened. Simple as that. Or corrected or disciplined. You could say it any which way. Right. 
uh, the word correction is used in here, and it's to restore to an upright or right state, improvement of life or character. Reproof is another word. It's that, which, that by which a thing is proved or a conviction. So you see these definitions. They're all kind of in the same bucket of child training and discipline. Uh, Psalm 94, 12 says, Blessed is the man whom you chasten, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your word. Chastening, teaching goes with chastening. Teaching goes with chastisement. So when you think chastisement, don't think bad things happen to me. Think, oh, God's trying to teach me from his word. Now, a lot of people that don't know his word, but know that one scripture, (laughs) they don't know anything about him. They don't know any of his promises or instructions or his conditions or anything. So anything that goes wrong in their life, they're thinking he's chastening. No, you're just ignoring all the instructions. If a child refuses to listen to their parent and just runs out the house and goes, goes does their own thing, they're, they're in trouble. They're at risk. So for us who deny the knowledge of God, just run off and never let him instruct us, we're not even close to being chastened. We're just susceptible to the world and the devil all without God. And that's really what, what happens to people that find themselves sick or Uh, in in some sort of calamity or tragedy or suffering, it's not chastisement. It's that they've they've lived too close to the fringe of the kingdom or outside the kingdom house. And they're just getting pummeled by the devil because he's out there seeking whom he may devour. And hopefully they'll repent so that they can escape the snare of the devil. So they're out there snared by the devil because they refused instruction. So chastisement really doesn't even apply to fringe believers. They're not even close enough. They're not even in the house to get rebuked. Or we could say they've ignored all the correction and rebuke. Now they're just out by themselves. That's a better way to look at it. Now, I don't know all the ramifications in the spirit of where, you know, when and God, what's he thinking and saying. I don't know all of it, but it's better to look at chastisement as not getting destroyed by the devil. Because if the devil ever comes knocking, you need to slam the door. Amen. When the devil comes knocking, that's not the time to say, oh, God, what are you doing to me? You see the problem? People have gotten sick and went to the hospital and blamed it on chastisement. Well, God, I guess he's chastening me for something. I guess he's correcting me for something. Could you please tell me how your sore throat, what did you do to get that sore throat? Let me just... Could, could you please tie that to some sin? What sin are you in that that sore throat? No, nobody ever knows. And that's one way that you know it's not chastisement. It's because if a parent ever chastens a kid, they better tell them why. If a kid ever gets spanked or disciplined, you better tell them why. You better instruct them what's going on at least the next day. It would be dishonorable to not tell the one you're correcting why they're being corrected. And Christians have no clue. Christians who claim they're being chastened with sickness, disease, or tragedy, they have no clue what they've done wrong. They've done so many things wrong, they don't know which one it's for. Amen. So it can't be chastised. It doesn't make any sense. In the Bible, God always told people what their sin was and what the repercussion was. And it wasn't necessarily him doing it. Now, I'm going to get to Old Testament versus New Testament because things have changed a bit. But if your sore throat was from a sin, then the very moment you repent, shouldn't you be healed? Yes. There you go. There you go. No one. I know very few stories of that being the case. So I'll show you how sin gets involved here and messes things up. Um, so not the second way that the Lord chastens us is by his spirit. Okay. Then the, God, Jesus was going to send the Holy Spirit. And he was going to convince or reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's going to do something to the world in their heart. And then he's going to live in us and he'll be with our heart. 
And he'll show us things. He'll guide us. He'll teach us. He'll remind us of everything the Father says. So the Holy Spirit is inside of us chastening us. He's the one that's nudging us. He's the one that's saying, you need to stop. He's the one that's saying, go tell them I'm sorry. He's the one that's saying, go to church. And if you start to quench the spirit, he's trying to help you do right things. He's trying to help you learn. He's trying to help you be in the right place. He's trying to help you be faithful, trying to help you commit, trying to help you serve, trying to help you be a good Christian. And if you keep refusing him, he will chasten you. And he'll, he'll make the feeling on the inside of you very disturbed. You'll be uncomfortable. You'll be convicted. You'll have emptiness. You'll have distance from God. It'll, it'll feel like you can't reach God. That's chastening. I'm telling you what, that's the worst feeling in the world when a Christian can't connect with their father whom they believe in fully. Part of chastening is you don't get to have his presence if you're going to live in disobedience. If you're not going to acknowledge the Holy Spirit, he's going to He's going to remove that sense of comfort, peace, presence, and righteousness. You're still righteous. You're still a son. But you're not going to experience it. You're going to miss his voice. That's part of chastening. When you can't hear God's voice, there's something that you're just ignoring. So, I mean, it is sinister. Look, for anybody that really wants to walk with God, chastisement is severe. We're not talking physical disease and tragedy and death. We're talking, oh no, the, the most important thing in my life is missing. My connection to God is, is suffering because of my immaturity. Everybody take a deep breath and go, So there's got to be a clear connection if, there, if chastening is really happening. I'm going to give you some examples from my book on chastening. But if, if chastening and chastisement is really happening, there should be a clear connection uh, between the mistake and the punishment. Like what is the punishment? What's the mistake? And what do I need to do to rectify it? It should be very clear because God's not going to leave you confused. Amen. Well, why is all this happening? I just don't know why all this would happen. It's not God. Uh, and a lot of times this is what happens, Okay. God's established promises. Here's your promise right here. I mean, he's given all these precious promises and you know them, you know a lot of them. And if for some reason you're not experiencing it, like you, you see it, I see it, I'm believing God for it, oh, but you just haven't received it. It's like, I can't get it. Why can't I get it? Well, there could be some chastening involved here, which is, wait, excuse me. This is not where I want to go. I wouldn't call this first moment chastening. What this is, is because you haven't acknowledged sin, it's contaminating you. And when sin contaminates our heart and we sense guilt in us, uh, guilt always causes your faith to leak out. So the only way I can get that is by faith. All promises are received by faith and only by faith. And without faith, you can't have the promise. You can't get it. You have to believe it very strongly, very peacefully, very relationally with God, rejoicing and knowing. All of that is necessary to have that. But if I'm in sin, if, if my heart condemns me, then I won't have confidence toward God. And I won't receive the answers to my prayers. 1 John 3.21, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence toward God and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things pleasing in his sight. But if my heart does condemn me for not listening to instruction, uh, not being corrected by God, refusing the voice of the Holy Spirit, refusing instruction and admonition from the word, then my, if my heart con does condemn me, I won't have confidence toward God and I can't get it. See that? So that's where sin and unrepentant lifestyle 
it keeps us further from the promise. I wouldn't say that's chastisement. The chastisement is the Holy Spirit saying, come on, come on, come on. The, the chastisement that God's going through with you is the Holy Spirit trying to help you repent, 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 repent. Change, change, fix, fix. Go to church, go to church, go to hang out with Christians, go to church, listen, obey, repent from that thing. Ask for forgiveness, forgive others. The Holy Spirit, he's, he's chastening in you the whole time. The reason you can't have the promise is not the chastening. The reason is because you can't trust him fully. So when you don't get the promise, don't think, God, what am I not doing? Well, you're not, you're not growing your faith. You're not stepping out in faith. Your faith is leaking out. Your faith is weak. That's not a condemnation. That's for you to take some steps. That's for you to make some decisions of will, make, make Get some revelation. We heard last Wednesday, get some revelation. You need revelation of a scripture if you're going to get that scripture. Right. If you're going to get a scriptural promise, you've got to have revelation. Right. Right. And, and one thing that attacks revelation knowledge is, is sin and condemnation and, and guilty heart, guilty conscience. When your conscience accuses you of sin, uh, uh, it's not chastisement, it's your conscience accusing you. So sin is the problem and your lack of faith is the problem and the Holy Spirit is trying to correct you and, and help you get to the word quicker. Help you pray in tongues so that you can, you know, resurrect your faith. F faith. You follow me? So that there is a little connection maybe there, but just realize it's the Holy Spirit saying, come on, come on, come on, that's chastisement. Stop it, stop it, stop it, that's chastisement. Can't have the promise can't have the promise. That's not God's first method of trying to correct you. Amen. It will seem like he's withholding, but it's not necessarily God withholding. It's right. you can't get close enough in faith. Wow. Okay. Uh, one example would be pride. So how many of you know pride is not too good? I mean, e even parents shouldn't be too proud of their children. I wouldn't live with that statement all the time, but it's okay. I mean, you can do it a little bit. We're talking about self-pride. We're talking about esteeming self. We're talking about things that uh, we elevate to protect us or shine the light on us or just have a wrong opinion of ourselves that's a little bit too high. Uh, so we know pride's wrong, but God will not strip prideful people of their job, their friends, their health, and their hope in order to prove the need to be humble. I've heard it before. God's just stripping me of my pride, going through terrible circumstances. God's stripping me of my pride. That's not how it works. Because you haven't humbled yourself, now the devil is eating your lunch. Right. Because you, you have to humble yourselves before God. Yeah. You have to draw near to God. And then, and then you'll have a chance to resist the devil. Yeah. But pride goes before the fall. Yeah. God resists the proud. So you could possibly say that chastisement is God resisting. Yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit saying you, God is not able to come close to you. That's the chastisement. So if you're in pride, you will feel distant. Make sense? But he's not destroying your life so that you'll repent. Chastisement is not having all these troubles happen for a month or 10 because God's, you know, he's really hammering me to make me turn. No, no, the Holy Spirit's hammering you on the inside to make you turn. You're not listening. Therefore, the devil's whipping you. It's almost like the, the Holy Spirit is your, your trainer in the corner, the boxing ring. And the trainer's trying to tell you what to do, trying to tell you what to do. It's the devil that's punching your lights out. <clears throat> God just can't uh, be too involved in our prideful life. So uh, it is true that our, our character weaknesses and lack of faith, they will expose, they will be exposed by life's hardships. If you have character flaws and stuff like that, 
Yes, life's hardships will expose it. But don't blame that on God's chastisement. That's just your stupidity. And, and, and you can say that because uh, you have to come to your senses and escape the snare of the devil. How do you do it? That you, you have to acknowledge truth. That you may acknowledge truth and come to your senses so that you can escape the snare of the devil. People have been taken captive by the devil because of things they don't know and things they won't acknowledge. Just separate that from chastisement. Don't look at God as the mean, you know, he's the mean, you know, gavel judge of my life. No, he's a, he's a father. He is the judge. Dad gets to decide. But don't look at him as some hard, hard taskmaster with, where everything's so confusing and he's just, you know, pummeling you all the time down here with all sorts of troubles because you're weak. That's just old, bad religious doctrine. Right. And you'll hear it. You'll hear it. You'll talk about people getting prayed for to be healed and uh, that God always heals people. And then you'll have somebody that comes from a particular denomination or two where they, they, they harp on this. But what about the chastisement of the Lord, chastening of the Lord? You know, don't despise it. Don't despise your sickness. He might have given you that to teach you something. No, no, he didn't need to give me sickness to teach me. He gave me his word. I'm pretty happy with that. That's right. Amen. I'm pretty much getting it right here. I got his word. And his, oh, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm pretty good. I don't need any sickness. Thank you very much. Go to 2 second, uh, Corinthians 7. Second Corinthians seven. Uh, now this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth, uh, kind of referring to the letter he had to write them to correct them. Uh, and here he's going to refer to it because they had done something and they were trying to. They got. They needed to take care of this fella who had been in sin. Verse 8, even if I made you sorry, 2 Corinthians 7, 8, even if I made you sorry with a letter, I don't regret it, though I did regret it, for I perceived the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. So this whole word for sorry, it's the same word uh, for sorrow and grief and affliction. Same word, okay? So the letter made them sorry. How, how did it make them sorry? With words. It was correction with words, which is how God does it. Verse 9, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow, what sorrow did they have? The sorrow was that they, were, they had done something wrong, needed to fix it. Not, not he crushed them, not that he, you know, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner. S made sorry in a godly manner, which would only be with words. They made, he, made him, he made them sorry with a letter. We got a bunch of letters to make us sorry. We have a bunch of letters to bring remorse to our spirit man that we have the need of correction in some areas. So don't, don't, bring, don't make it physical just because pain seems physical. But your sorrow led to repentance. They changed without having to have the leg broke. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. How was godly sorrow caused? With a letter, with words, with instruction, with rebuke, with child training. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Here is where he brings out the, the, the contrast. The opposite of, of godly sorrow, which causes you to repent, is worldly sorrow. That doesn't cause you to repent. It causes death. So somebody gets cancer, that's worldly sorrow. That's not godly sorrow. Cancer is not godly rebuke. And godly sorrow causes you to repent. I have yet to find a Christian who gets sick 
and comes out totally repented. That's not, the, that's not usually the result. God had to put me in the hospital to get me to change. I, I don't see you coming out more holy and godly. I see you coming out relieved if you, if you make it out. I've also seen a lot of people die and get buried. They didn't come out. They didn't get a chance to repent. It's just not the way it works. Now, look, anytime something goes wrong in your life, you start repenting. I get that. I get that. But I don't see a lot of holiness and godliness coming out of the hospital. I see a lot of tragedy and sorrow and just wore out trying to get back on track. Not, not like some spiritual development occurs in the hospital. Spiritual development doesn't happen in the hospital very often. I know because I go in there and the TV's on. They're just. They're not Bible studying. They're not praying in tongues. That's just not what happens when you're, when you're taken out. When you're, when, you're, when you're hurt, when you're suffering, when you're in pain. That's not when you're growing spiritually. So let's remove that word chastisement from all sorts of tragedy and suffering. Praise the Lord. Lord. Glory to God. Uh, Let me mention something about the Old Testament because that... This truth started in the Old Testament. It is true that if you're a real son, you'll get chastened by the Lord. Job said it. Uh, But then in Job, you also see who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Job said, therefore, I uttered what I didn't understand and things too wonderful for me, which I didn't know. He applied it wrong. Job's calamity had nothing to do with chastisement, had nothing to do with God correcting him, had nothing to do with God teaching him. It had everything to do with the devil eating somebody's lunch. It had everything to do with the devil destroying a life without a savior. Had nothing to do with God teaching him anything or correcting him for anything. God never said in the book of Job that he was correcting him for something. Never. But Job's confused, so he's just saying everything he can think of under the sun. I don't want to despise the chastening from the Lord. It wasn't that. But he did... The Holy Spirit let him say a truth. The truth is, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit's trying to convince you of something or train you or teach you. In the Old Testament, though, you'll see many times uh, that the calamity was almost a thermometer for disobedience and sin. Because none of them had the Holy Spirit inside them. And none of them had the Word of God written on their heart. And none of them had a Bible. The priest had the book and they read it to the people so the people understood some of the law. Uh, But in the Old Testament, the thermometer was calamity. How do you know you're doing well? You're getting blessed. How do you know you're doing bad? You're getting calamity. Because that's the way God did it in the Old Testament. It was physical. But now we have the word and the spirit. We don't need a thermometer to tell us if I'm doing right or wrong. I can know inside if I'm doing right or wrong. So it's all changed to the inside of us. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when God speaks, he speaks to our spirit. In the Old Testament, he had to speak to their ears. That's why few got to hear God. Only the prophet, only the priest, only the kings occasionally, only a few people occasionally. Now he doesn't speak out here. So don't be looking with your ear ear flaps. Listen with your spirit. So you're going to have to really acknowledge some chastening in your spirit, man. Praise the Lord. Now, if uh, there's probably some severe cases, okay, uh, of people that, number one, are either really close to the Lord and and, and needing to obey his will in a very fine-tuned, 
precise manner. We've heard some stories from preachers who felt like this calamity came because I had stepped outside the will of God. But not because God put it on them, but because they stepped away from the Lord in a, in a, big, a very important way, and the devil saw that. And so that's where you would see, well, the Lord allowed, and yeah, he allowed because the person stepped away from him, and the devil got hold of something. And in that case, in the stories I've heard, the person repents, instantly fixed, instantly back. So don't get that extreme. Don't take it that far. Obey God early so that you don't step away from his presence and and be open prey to the devil. It's just Christians want to think that God has added cancer and storms and car accidents to his character development toolbox. I've never seen those things teach people. They're just lacking the word of God trying to find some connection to God. It's not right, though. Praise the Lord. Uh, There's been other cases where it seems like if somebody is going to refuse to repent over a long period of time, uh, God will just bring them home. I wouldn't call that chastisement. I would call that the mercy of God. So th- there is a time when we've, we've really violated too much, and God knows our heart. And so, so that we don't continue in disbelief and, and to a place of rejecting Christ or something, we've seen him bring people home, and it seems very merciful that he did that. And you'll see that even in Scripture. You'll see it in uh, the Corinthian church, you know, turn this fellow over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his soul could be saved. Even if he died, his soul would be saved. Now, let me read you a couple of examples uh, in God Why. And and I'm not, these are just hypotheticals. So, uh, it's kind of a long chapter. It's only five pages. So, you'll have to get the book and read it. How many of you have read it? Maybe I don't have to read it in here. A few of you have read it. Um, so just a few examples here. Number one, a small child ignores his parents' instruction and touches the hot stove. Is the burn he receives considered parental correction? No, of course not. He just disobeyed. No, the parent had nothing to do with it. What happens is that after the child is hurt, the parent helps him, comforts him, and reminds him. Reminds him of the initial instruction, rebukes him for violating the natural law that had already been explained to him. The burn was because of a bad choice, not parental chastening. The chastisement was accomplished only with words, both before and after the event. Pretty clear, right? Hypothetical number two. A teenager decides to refuse his parents' instructions and continues hanging out with certain troublemakers at school. He begins to experiment with drugs and alcohol and ignores his parents' repeated warnings. What happens? First, the teen- teenager is firmly rebuked by his parents. Next, the teenager is grounded. But every time he leaves the house, his rebellion opens the door to destruction. Parents aren't harming him. Parents aren't causing trouble. The parents are chastening, rebuking, and attempting to train him so he doesn't hurt himself. But the kid is ignoring them. Eventually, he finds himself either arrested, addicted to drugs, broke, or in some accident. Tragic, but it certainly wasn't the parents' fault nor God's doing. Or the parents are finally, once they're of age, forced to remove the young adult from the house to live on his own. Righteousness and love are sometimes tough, but if we side with them, they occasionally require us to remove ourselves from the ungodly ones or them from us. Right. But did you see where the chastisement stopped and the law of sin and death began? Right. Right. Any parent that has to remove an adult child because their lifestyle is just wreaking havoc on the family, that's not chastisement. That's judgment. You see the difference? The chastisement is while they're in the house, you're trying to fix their problems. If they continue, then they're outside of the blessing. And basically all the, all the parent did was let them have what they wanted. They wanted to be away. They wanted right. to do their own thing. God allows that to us many times. Right. And that's why I say those who don't want to be instructed by God, he says, okay, illegitimate son. Illegitimate son. Right. 
Those who don't want to be close and let him be a father to us, they, they believe in him with all their heart, they say. Yep. And God's like, do what you want to do. Not in the family, but I wouldn't call what happens to them chastisement. It's like the prodigal son. His father said, go ahead, here's all your stuff. Never hurt him. Never chopped his toe off. Didn't do anything like that. And received him straight back as soon as he came back. But all the, all the lessons that child learned were not chastisement. Remember the prodigal? He went out there, he lost all of his stuff, spent all of his money, found himself eating what the pigs, taking care of the pigs, wishing he could eat what they were eating. All of those lessons he learned had nothing to do with chastisement. Hypothetical number three, you realize you're a fairly impatient person, maybe you even make a request to God for him to help you develop patience. And then the very next day in a big city, you find yourself in traffic jam, getting very impatient and angry. The question is, did he cause the traffic jam to test your patience and improve you? <laughs> of course not. The city construction caused it, the multitude of cars caused it, or the wreck caused it, but it wasn't God. But it did test your patience, didn't it? Just don't call that chastisement. The chastisement would be the Holy Spirit in your heart saying, remember yesterday? Remember what you asked? It's a good chance for you to apply it. But he didn't cause the trouble. Hypothetical four, you're working on a business deal with a person who lies, cheats, and manipulates. Could try your patience. Forces you to endure and suffer for a while. But is it God who is causing it? Of course not. God wouldn't cause someone to lie and cheat just so he could help you develop character. And he wouldn't go looking for an ungodly person to partner with, for you to partner with for the purpose of making you miserable. Say it again. Come on. Come on. The way, that God, the way that God develops your character is with instruction and not by throwing sinners in your path to distress you. So what caused this affliction in your life? Someone sinned. Nothing to do with chastisement. You're going you're to learn a ton of lessons in life without any, any involvement from God's chastisement. Amen. How do you handle this affliction in your life? Uh, stay full of God's spirit, full of love and full of joy on the inside and win sinners to Jesus. Amen. Come on, apply all this stuff in church so that you can handle all of life's difficulties. Amen. Hypothetical number five, I got a flat tire in the rain and it wasn't fun. I had my best suit on. I had to use my patience, my wisdom and my tire changing skills and I was late to work, but was it God who poked my tire? God's testing me. He's really, he's really testing me. He's really. No, it was the nail that poked your tire. God doesn't use nails in the road to train us. He does it spiritually by his word and his spirit within us. He prepares us ahead of time for the nails of life, but he's never the one shooting them at us. Now, the one thing I like to add to that kind of a story is anytime something goes a little awkward in life, it doesn't seem it's like, oh man, what a terrible thing I have to go through. Make sure you look for opportunities to, to lead people to Jesus. So God knew the nail was coming and he also knew who was going to come up behind you to help you lead him to Christ, that type of thing. So always be on the lookout rather than so mad that something went wrong or looking up, God, why would you let this happen right in the middle of the whatever? Be cool. Uh, here's a good one where you do see a little bit of a chastisement and, and, and some of the repercussions. Uh, you're in a financial difficulty. The bills are coming faster than the income. The terrible trial continues for months. Then you're tempted to lose patience and faith. But is it God the one testing you or chasing you? No. God has already established his perfect will in the area of money. He wants us to have enough and more. And he's even taken the responsibility as a good father would to feed us, clothe us, and close up clothe us and give us a place to live if we trust him without worrying. He has promised us Matthew 6, in case you're wondering where that is. 25 through 34. He's promised all believers he would always provide for their basic needs and even goes further to command that we never even take a thought about it. He tells us to never worry about tomorrow, but only to do one thing. If we'll only seek God, his kingdom, his righteousness, his truth, he'll provide for us. So what's causing the problem? Other people or the world or the devil or us. 
Either the economy is slowing a little, or maybe our company made some bad decisions, lost sales, had to lay people off, or the devil sent a plot against us. Or some emergency forced us into momentary debt. Maybe we made some bad choices in our spending. Maybe it's a spiritual matter. Maybe we lost a job because we were lazy or had a bad attitude. Of course, that's not any of y'all, I'm sure. Maybe we bent our ethics and blew it. Maybe we just didn't hold strong in faith, trusting God to simply provide for us. Maybe we just didn't keep ourselves from worrying as God instructed and found ourselves continuously stressing out about tomorrow. It's not God chastening you. It's just you're not following the principles of faith to get the blessing. Or maybe we just never moved closer to God and found ourselves without the ability to confidently trust him. Maybe we were so worried that we couldn't even give our tithes and offerings freely. Oh, I better skip this part. And we stopped honoring God with our substance. It is true that God will refrain from answering our prayer and allow us to continue in hardship, but the reason is not because of correction. The correction is the Holy Spirit saying, you got a lot of things you got to shore up here. You got to plug those, bucket, those holes in your bucket. You got, come on, you got to obey. You got, come on, come on, come on. He's, he's cheering you on from the corner. He's coaching you. He's leading you. He's guiding you. He's instructing you. He's rebuking you in your spirit. That's the chastisement of God, not the outward effects. Right. It's not because of correction, it's because of our doubt-filled, fear-filled, unconfident hearts keep him from answering our prayers. And we're left to continue through the natural course of hardship like everybody else. Praise the Lord. Hypothetical number seven. Did I say the other one was the last one? Hypothetical number seven is the last one. You need, you need to know this one? This has to do with your job. You find yourself at a job with an ungodly, cantankerous boss in a position that's not very fulfilling. Let's also say you're a Christian and already know that you're, you're to have a good attitude and be full of joy and love and peace. And you know that God is instructed to never murmur, complain, or whine, but to do our job cheerfully and honorably as under the Lord. So that's the instruction from the Lord. Our, our, the, the Holy Spirit knows if you're doing it. So forget the, the, the mean boss. How are you doing? Forget all the crazy stuff at work. How, how are you doing? You doing your part? Because that's what the Holy Spirit's going to be nudging you on and scratching you on and, and yanking you about. However, at work, you've been frustrated, discontent, complaining, and irritable. You're tired of your boss and your job responsibilities. At night, you petition God for a new job, a raise, and a new Christian boss. But then throughout the day, you murmur and complain to your spouse, friends, and coworkers about how fed up you are. Months go by and God doesn't answer. He usually won't. First of all, God doesn't want to take us out of the ungodly world around us and send us to a monastery type Christian only workplace. I like to have a Christian boss. No, God wants us right in the middle of people who need help. We're the light of the world and the sinners need us. Your ungodly boss needs to see a real genuine believer. Your coworkers need someone to show them the way to God and be an example of Christ on the earth. Jesus prayed, not that God would take us out of the world, but, but only keep us from the evil of it. But in this scenario, you've not been a light to those around you. You've not been a good, loving Christian witness, and you probably have not been a very good employee. God cannot promote you yet. I believe that God sometimes has sent us to a particular place of employment with the sole purpose of somehow witnessing to those there. And until we've done so, he's not interested in moving us to a different one. God would love for you to have a new job and a raise because God loves to bless people. Bless his people. Even more than that, though, God wants to perfect you into godliness. But in this scenario, your attitude has caused you to stagnate in your spiritual growth and even injured your quality of work. You become somewhat unfaithful in your current position, so God knows you will not be faithful in the next. So there is no next. So this is where you see, okay, you're, you're refusing his correction. Okay, you're far from him. You can't get the, the blessing. The promise seems to fall through your fingers. It's just not, you're not close enough to him because of You've neglected the Holy Spirit in so many ways. And all, the, and all the time, those words from the Bible are still there, ever present, calling out to you to repent and walk in love and be a solid Christian. Even if you don't read them or heed them, God's given them. Whether it works or not, you've been chastened. But don't call God mean or uncaring. It's all on you. Our responsibility to endure honorably has no timetable. We don't do it with the threat of God. Now you have so many weeks to do this for me. Instead, we do it with joy, knowing that promote. Denise, we know you wouldn't do it. <laughs> Just in case anybody else might. 
I love that. Oh! Oh! <laughs> but notice, in this chastisement, God did not get you fired. He did not starve your children. He didn't break your arm. So there are limits to God's, God's child training techniques. And just because we aren't perfect and may need some chastening doesn't mean the mishap we face is actually that. Got it? <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. All right. A night to remember? Uh, hopefully we've, we've thrown the, the false or misinterpretation into the wastebasket, but we've also elevated the need for us to honor the chastening of the Lord and do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Sometimes when delays come and when it just seems like, man, it could be, cha it could be, uh, make some adjustments. Go ahead and just, you know the thing. We've talked about this many times where the Holy Spirit will put his finger on the one thing. Like tonight, you might have heard. The Holy Spirit might have put, put his finger on one thing that you really need to acknowledge. What is it? Go ahead and fix that. He, he's doing it gently. He's a, he's, he's a father to us. So we don't want to neglect those things, right? Thank you for joining Pastors Chaz and Joni today from Houston Faith Church. If you're looking for a good home church in Houston, Texas, we'd like to invite you to be our guest anytime. What you'll find is that Houston Faith Church is highly committed to the Word of God, the love of God, and the Spirit-filled life and ministry that Jesus expects. We know that everyone wants to make a difference in this life, and that the Great Commission of the Lord Jesus Christ is the main thing for all of us. You'll find your purpose here and grow strong in faith at Houston Faith Church. Find more faith-building resources on our YouTube channel or subscribe to our free audio podcast. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. See you soon.